Hey everybody, welcome to the Growing Gills Book Club today. I'm really excited to be here with you um, and talking today about habits again because habits is what we talk about all the time. And um, it's funny for me to rediscover my book as I'm um, rereading for this book club and seeing how I'm mentioning various things in various places and realizing I really need to pull those things together. And one of the things that I've learned in the last couple of years is how much foregrounding the value of habits per se is so valuable. I was talking about routine, I was talking about, you know, doing things regularly and showing up to your work and treating it as a job and all those kinds of things. But I didn't say the word habits enough, and so I'm saying it now. Habits, habits, habits. Um, so the key thing about habits that I want you guys to take away from today, so, take notes, I'm asking for takeaways at the end, you know it right at the beginning, is that habits are not just key to um, checking things off your list and feeling great because like, oh, I did my thing today. It's not just about I brushed my teeth or something like that. Um, habits are actually the key to unlocking um, like passion and inspiration and all of these things that we think are kind of magical. And this is the thing I keep getting back to is that as much as I love all my woo people who love, you know, thinking about connecting with the universe and all these kind of magical kinds of things, what we do here is all achievable without magic. You do not have to tap into anything magical. If you take certain steps um, that are tailored around you and who you are, you're going to get to new results and changes for yourself. And you have to trust that system and trust that that is something that you can do that is accessible to you. And that's one reason why I really like to stay away from sort of magical language and like positive thinking and all this other stuff. Like act the thing, do the action, and the result will follow. Um, it's not do the thinking and the result will follow. Thinking does not lead to action. Action leads to thinking. That is basically true. So with this, um, the idea of implementing habits that are become reliable and that are something that you um, can stick with over the long term, which means that they're doable, that they are human scaled, that they are uh, built around who you are and what works for you. You're not constantly struggling against something in order to do the action. When you put those things into place, it just opens up a world of possibility for you. So, um, so I'm really excited to talk about that today. Um, I think this this meeting is going to be slightly short um, because I need to move to another meeting right at um, right at noon. But um, I, but I think we've got plenty of time for this. So going back through my notes for the chapter, um, one of the things I start the chapter off with, and I think um, is worth repeating again, is that routine and habits are a bridge over anxiety. So you talk about this, I talk about this pit of anxiety that people experience um, it, trying to start something. That starting action, like that, that moment of starting is just so, so difficult for so many people, including me. Um, and the thing that gets you from here to the other side of that pit of anxiety fastest is having a habit and you just do a thing. You take an action and then things start to unwind from there and like move forward. Um, I was talking to um, another uh, career focused student recently about this and she was talking about how much anxiety she feels about doing her work how much sort of you know self-talk there is trying to prevent her from getting to, to her work every day you know just incredible wall of like stuff going on in her head as she tries to get there when she's actually in the work it goes away as soon as, as it's over it comes back as kind of a um, vulnerability hangover you know like when you do the thing that you say you're going to do a lot of times afterwards there's kind of a, a slap back effect afterwards and so we talked a lot about having um putting habits in place that are minimal keeping the expectations low making sure there's like a slot in your day for this thing that it's not something you're trying to jam in between other things that all of these things are really really going to help and um for me getting started in the morning just like sitting down and getting started is a habit for me you know, I'm sitting here by like 9 a.m. every day and I've got my, got my tea and I'm all set. Um, and that is, that's how I get started with my day. So whatever is happening, I don't really think about like, how am I going to achieve that? How 
is it worth it? Like, can I blah, blah, blah. I just sit down and I start on the next thing on my list. So um, this is a uh, really, really pivotal concept that a for a lot of people feels super <laughs> unromantic and like irritatingly straightforward. People want magic, you know, you want a magic bullet, you want like to have the answer just kind of off the bat, it, you want it to be something that's like about your, I mean, even if it, this is painful, you want it to be somewhere, something about like your core sort of like readiness to be the person that you need to be in the world or something like that. And it's not, it's just about taking the actions. And so it was funny because in the Autonomous Creative Collective, which is the membership community that goes along with the Creative Focus Workshop, we had Habits Month, I think in February, <laughs> where, you know, every month I have a theme and there's sort of weekly posts that go along with like, try this and implement that and give it, give this a try. I gotta say Habits Month, not popular. People were like, oh, Habits, so boring, Ugh. which I totally get. Like the previous month had been Big Picture Month where we're all talking about our vision for our creative life and everybody loved that. Um, but when it came to Habits Month, I already like, oh God, all right, so I guess we're doing this. All right, let's go. Um, so I understand if you feel that way, I think it's a normal way to feel, but I think it is, uh, it, it is magic. Taking these simple actions is magic. Not thinking about the big picture, not focusing on the end result is magic. Like a lot of that fear that happens in that self-talk has to do with perfectionism, thinking about like what, um, the end result is, or it may have to do with shoulds and other people coming at you and sort of in your head telling you what, how to behave and how to align your behavior. So um, the way to develop habits then is to look at your actual life and um, what the circumstances of your life are, where can you fit a habit in your day? So we don't talk about this in the book so much, but this is something I've gotten from um, other writing about habits. Uh, in particular, one, ha one book I like a lot is uh, Twyla Tharp's The Creative Habit. Um, and another book that I like a lot and it's much more recent and more tactical is James Clear's Atomic Habits, which I think is a very um, solid book about exactly how to develop habits, how to think through habits. Um, Sanya says, so habits are not magic, but they make magic. Exactly. Like you do something that seems like totally mundane and the net result of it at the end will be something magical. And an interesting thing that James Clear has in his book about habits is like, he has this little chart, right? And it's like habits over time, how they build your results. And, um, and he plots that against your expectations, like what you think is going to happen if you sort of just take the waiting for inspiration route. And, um, and there's a little, there's like a little dip there where it's like, you initially don't get the results you think you're going to get and you have to stick with the habit and eventually you get these sort of exponential results from it. But your expectation is like out of line. And so you're seeing like, I'm doing the thing and nothing's happening. It's week two, you know, I'm not feeling inspired. Jessica, what's up? Like, this isn't what was promised, but it's something where you really do have to trust the system and that's the magical piece of it. it like the results will happen, but you have to give it time and you have to give it space. So beating per, per, um, perfectionism, beating shoulds, all has to do with like, this is my job, this is what I do. And that's identity change. Again, identity change that I'm the person who shows up, I'm the person who does this. This is the kind of person I am. I'm the kind of person who shows up to work in the morning. That's my self identity. I show up to the work in the morning. If I didn't have that identity, it would be much, much harder for me. And it used to be much harder for me to show up to work in the morning. Like I thought I am a person who can't get up in the morning and can't get started. I have, um, I'm always sleeping late. I like to stay up late. You know, I do all these different things. I can't really control when I start my day. Like I, those were all stories that I had for myself. And I had to, through action, change my identity to be, I'm a person who gets started in the morning. That's, what, that's how I function. And it is very, very solid as an identity at this point and is amazingly helpful in get, keeping me moving forward. Um, so let's see. In the chapter, I quote Chuck Close, which I now feel fairly uh, conflicted about after the revelations in Me Too about Chuck Close. In a future edition, I may replace him with Twyla Tharp or somebody else. But anyway, he's in there. And I don't think that what he says is wrong, even though um, I wish it weren't coming out of his mouth. Um, 
the uh, idea that inspiration emerges from habit. And so those are some quotes that I really think you guys should take, take to heart, even, you know, with the caveat of the source of them. Um, so the things you can do to develop habits are, first of all, you identify a time of day uh, where you already have other habits. Sometime, this is from James Clear, sometime when you already have other things going on that you can tack a new habit onto. You've got a little bit of room, you can like move things around so you have 15 minutes or 20 minutes that's tacked onto the end of your morning routine or tacked onto you know, the end of just making coffee if you don't feel like you really have a solid morning routine or maybe it's lunch or maybe it's something else. Like, what can you tack this onto that already has so much stability that you would be like, whoa, if it weren't there, like if your morning routine didn't happen, it would just throw you for a loop. So adding this to that routine starts to give it a little bit more solidity very quickly. So that's number one. Number two is um, start very small. Do not start with, I need to work for three hours on my project. You know, if you're having trouble implementing a habit, not you could work on it three hours sometime, but like if you're having a hard time doing it daily or whatever, like every two days or whenever it needs, you need to do it, start small so that you're doing a five minute habit or a 10 minute habit rather than trying to immediately implement like an hour and a half or something like that, which just can really disrupt your day in the way that 10 or 15 minutes can't. Once you have the habit of showing up, you can expand it. So you need a habit of some kind in order to make the habit better. That is a key concept as well. The other thing that I talk about in, in the book that I think is worth getting into and, and my question for you today would be setting the table. So I do quote James Clear in there. This is like pre-atomic habits from an article of his about catalyst and activation energy. So activation energy is a chemi chemistry term that has to do with how much energy does it take to get started with something like with a chemical reaction, like what, how much energy do you have to put into this reaction in order for it to do its thing? And um, for some things, it's a lot of active, activation energy and for some it's just a little. Um, and if you're trying to do something that's difficult for you, uh, like commit to uh, com your creative practice of, on a daily basis or whatever it is, it's gonna require a lot initially of activation energy. That's why you make it small. So it requires less activation energy you tack it onto another habit, so it requires less activation energy. And these kinds of things are catalysts for the reaction. So again, chemistry term, if you have something that requires a lot of activation energy, sometimes you can add a chemical catalyst that actually reduces the amount of activation energy you need to put into it. So thinking about what those catalysts might be, like you need to be in certain clothes in order to do your work. So having those clothes be what are set out in the morning um, for you to put on can help you be a catalyst for getting the work done. And I'm calling that setting the table. So I talk about the idea of setting the table frequently in order to get, to solidify a habit. So what can you do to set the table for your habit so that it's the thing that you do in the morning or whenever the time of day is? Like how can you set up your physical space so it's the only thing that occurs to you? How can you make it easier to roll on into that and Look at all the distractions that typically take you away from it and make those things harder. Make starting easier, make the distractions harder. Put those things into, you know, out of balance in the opposite direction, and you're more likely to be able to do that. So I would challenge you right now to think about the idea um, of, active, of setting the table and what does setting the table look like for you? What do you need in place in order to start work on whatever you're working on right now? Put that in the comments. What uh, what does setting the, what could setting the table look like for you? And this is particularly challenging right now where we're all working and living in the same space where you can't just like leave a whole thing set out usually because you have to use that space for something else. So when and how can you set the table to take the next step with that project? Um, so that's question number one. I'm taking a look in the comments to wait for that, those things to show up. I'm sure it's going to take a second. Question number two is what time and associated with what other habits, when can you do this habit on a daily basis? Or if it's only weekdays, it's only weekdays or whatever, but like how can you attach it to something that you already do? Um, so Corrine says, I need to make my art room more comfortable, more appealing for thinking and not just doing. I have a wall of reference books, but no place to sit and use them in that room. So Corrine, what would setting the table look like? It would look like, in this case, potentially if you need reference books in order to do your work, which you may not, but if you do, 
Maybe it means getting a chair and a little side table and putting them down next to your reference shelf so that you're ready to go. Maybe you get out the book that you need to use next the night before. You don't open it, but you put it on the side table. That could be a way to set the table for doing reference research. Um, the, in general, like uh, if, if you need to incorporate like a thinking process into your creative work, that is a thing that you would want to do. Julia says, set up my sacrificial studio clothes and shoes. Assuming like you do dirty work and so you need to have like dirty clothes. Yeah, set those things out, get them on first thing in the morning and you're ready to go. There's no friction when you need to translate or transition from breakfast to working or whatever it is. You just walk in there and you do it. Now, maybe you don't wanna wear d dirty shoes in the house, but you could take those shoes and put them right next to your kitchen table, say, and then you can walk out with those things. Joan says, make distractions harder. Interesting, I've never tried that. Try it, it's amazing. So like if your phone is distracting and you don't need your phone when you're working, put your phone like in your coat pocket, it, you know, in another room so you can't hear it or see it. It's not sitting in front of you. I and mean, the studies have shown that having a phone even sitting, mine is right here, sitting on the table, uh, even face down, will uh, reduce people's ability to focus on what's in front of them. So if your phone is a source of distraction and it is for just about everybody, consider taking it out of your view and potentially out of the room when you're working. Um, you can set alarms like on your computer or something else or like a timer if you need to go check your phone for something. But, you know, think about how you can make those things harder. That's just one idea. Coral says, I have to make a, make a sketch at night to be ready to ink it first thing in the morning. Potentially, Coral, yes, maybe that's the end of your daily process of your work is to make a sketch for tomorrow, but it doesn't necessarily need to be at night. It may be that you're inking, then you sketch. Instead of sketching and then inking, you ink, and it's because it's an easier thing to roll into, then you sketch at the end of your work period, and then it's ready for tomorrow. The idea of requiring yourself to get down to work and like make work in the evening may or may not work for you. A lot of people, including me, pretty tapped out by the evening. I can't really do a lot of major work. I can do some reading maybe, but the idea of sitting down at my work table and doing a drawing for the next day, that's a high ask. So pay attention to that and see whether that makes sense for you. Janice says, when I've been away from my studio for a long period of time, I need to clean up my work table before I can fully commit to the work. I literally set my table up with tools and supplies so they are ready to use. Good, Janice, but how about flipping that? And when you stop working, you set the table for the next time. So a cleanup process and getting your tools out is actually the end of your process from the previous work session. So the next work session is like just falling off a log. You know, you're right there already. You don't have to clean up first. Um, okay. Alexis says, been trying to keep my desk clean, even if it, I have to stack everything else on the floor instead of worrying about it to give it a permanent home, giving it a permanent home. Yes. I mean, Alexis, you have two things going on here. First of all, keeping your desk clean is going to keep things rolling, but also you have a bunch of stuff that you need to deal with, you probably want to put a open loops session in your calendar at some point over, say, the next few weeks. Like, get that piled, put it all together, put a time on your calendar to deal with it, and then go deal with it and put those things away. Because if they're continuously der derailing you, they need dealing with. Doesn't mean you need to do all the things, but you need to know what all the things are and put them in your open loops list so that you can come back to that later. I'm talking a lot about cleaning up at the end of your session, which is obvious. Often, like we don't let we don't allow time for that because you like work right up to whenever it is, and then like stop and leave. Um, I really recommend thinking about implementing a shutdown routine at the end of your work work day, because if you have that shutdown routine in there, which includes kind of it doesn't have to be major cleaning, but just like tidying, clearing off distractions, making sure you're ready to go for tomorrow. Um, it helps your brain kind of shut down and reset for rest and hanging out with friends and all that other stuff, but it also sets the table for tomorrow. Liz says, longer term, I could finish organizing the office to give myself a nicer sp space to work. Short term, I could move my art table to be more ergonomic and with better light. My paints can be next to the work workspace. Absolutely, I would say do that today. Like those are, is, if you can do a, a mini version of this immediately, I think that would be 100% worth it. Um, Nikki says, one of the challenges I'm running into is that I have great habits and very efficient at writing, but I, and I know exactly what I need, but now that I'm focusing on a different medium performing, I'm having trouble figuring out how to adjust. 
Well, I think that that is a moment for pulling back strategically and thinking like, okay, when has this worked for me before? What are the conditions I need for getting ready to perform, writing for performing, rehearsing, whatever the element is that you're doing? What do you need in front of you? What do you need around you? Write it down, make a checklist, get clear on that instead of kind of getting to the moment going like, wait, wait, what do I do again? And try to figure it out right in that moment. That's going to really slow you down. Anne says, I made a small working space versus no permanent space. Excellent. Good work. Um, Susie says, setting the table. I'm lucky to have my own room to work in. I've cleared my table from all those open loop bits of paper, and et cetera, and leave my notebook and pens out next to the keyboard. Perfect. That seems like a really good way to do that. Um, Celeste is leaving notebooks and reference books on the desk the night before, so ready to roll when I hit my desk. Um... Allison says, I started re leaving the window of what I want to work on open on my laptop, so, laptop so I don't get distracted and checking email or social first thing. Very good. And if you have those tabs open, close those tabs. You have to literally go open them. If that's distracting for you first thing in the morning, don't leave them open like in the background somewhere. Just actually close the tabs. Susanna is leaving my sketchbook open with a pencil right where I, I drink my coffee every morning. Perfect. Great way to do that. And then, of course, you want to say, and I'm going to blah, 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 while I'm drinking coffee, like define the parameters of that. Um, okay, lots of great comments here, you guys. Okay, so I think one of the things I want to point out to you is there's lots of good ideas in the comments. And so jump into the comments and kind of comb through those and look for things that might help you to get uh, your routine, you know, more in shape. So Syl says, I need to tidy up my studio, studio space once and for all, by the way, there's no once and for all. It'll be untidy again soon. Just make it something that you do regularly. Um, that will mean being able to have my art and writing PC ready for me and close the door. So closing the door, if you have private space and you're you know, lucky enough to have some kind of a studio where you can get in there and close the door, is a huge sort of psychological trigger to you that it's time to work. So think about that as being your habit. Not I start working, not I this, not I that, but I go into the room and I close the door. It can be a magical uh, feeling non-magical habit. Okay, seeing lots of good stuff in here. Um, I'm going to quickly scan through and see if we have some questions in the comments. I see one from Christine. I was doing so well with growing gills and getting control and this week all my resolve to create new habits seems to have disappeared. Any tricks to keep the momentum of improving going? Uh, I think again habits are the answer. Like this is true of like working on a course. It's true of working on, you know, working through this book. The beginning of it is going to be like the rush of energy of like the newness and like, oh, it's exciting. And I'm doing all these things. Um, and this is true of a project too. Like you start the project and like, oh my God, it's so exciting. There are all these like, different things I can investigate. I'm going to research. I'm going to make sketches. I'm going to, oh, oh, but like before you know it, you hit this kind of mountainous amount of stuff. You start getting perfectionistic about things to think about like, you know, how am I ever going to achieve this? How am I ever going to get to the end of this? You start um, seeing the work that goes into it and going like, oh my God, like this and this and this and this. And that's when most people stop. That's when you get held up. If this sounds familiar to you, like raise your hands because like this is so common. It's common for me. It's everybody. Um, that is where your habits need to kick in. So this is exactly the right thing to be talking about right now. If you're feeling like, oh my God, growing gills is kind of overwhelming. There's like a lot of stuff to do. I don't know how to fix my life and all in one. Totally understandable. But that's the moment when you have, need to say like, I show up and do this. This is what I do. I show up to this work 15 minutes a day or uh, for an hour twice a week or whatever the thing is. Attach it to some other habit, put it in your calendar, get it in there and make it an appointment with yourself. No one can force you to do this. And that is why it's so damn hard, right? Nobody is there holding you to this. That is, so that is why habits are the only thing they're going to hold it all together. Um, so Christine, I hope that helped, but that's really, and, and I know you're now in um, the creative focus workshop as well. It's the same kind of thing is going to happen there. But part of what we do in the autonomous creative collective is to, um, have weekly habits for the entire collective. So we have setting top three goals for the week at the beginning of the week. We have weekly reflections at the end of the week, which by the way is the next chapter we're going to talk about weekly review. Um, and we have various kinds of check-ins through the week. 
to help people stay on track because it is so hard over the long term. That's why we're doing it together. So welcome. Haven't seen the uh, collective yet, but I'm really excited to get started with you. Um, okay. Looking for questions, looking for questions. Joanne is raising her hand. Lotta is raising her hand. All right. Yeah, I know you guys recognize this. It's so common. It's like just basically that is the structure of the creative process. Like everything I've seen everywhere in every context is like there's this initial excitement. It goes down this down this pit and eventually you have to climb your way back up. And the climbing your way back up, that is where habits live. You have to have the habit to get yourself to the end of the project and to finish the project. Um, okay, good. I'm glad that helps, Christine. We can help you. We're there for you. Um... Good. Okay. I think we're good here. I'm going to um, call this a little bit early so I can transition to my next meeting. Um, thanks for being here today. I hope you all noticed that I posted a book talk event with um, Jen Loudon, who I think is really great and has so much empathy for the kinds of these moments of like feeling really stuck and feeling like I can't get through this, you know, doldrums in the middle of a project. Like she's so good at that. And so she's going to be coming and presenting her book for the ACC, the Autonomous Creative Collective and for the book club. Um, in a Zoom meeting uh, a week from tomorrow. And so sign up on the event in order to get the Zoom link when on the day. I'm not posting it early just for security reasons. I'll post it you know, on Thursday, a week from Thursday. Um, but I hope you'll all come to that. And next time through, we're gonna be doing um, weekly review. This phase right now, what we're doing right now, this is the act phase of the creative engine and the act phase is where the pedal hits the metal. So. If this feels hard, that's normal and totally okay. Um, hit me up with takeaways in the comments and I will be back on Friday. Bye.